uh, current threat landscape. I don't want you to bore. Uh, I don't want to bore you all with um, you know all the things that are happening in the world. Uh, but I do want to highlight some of the things that what we are seeing and how it relates to the the industry and across the world too. Um, ransomware, phishing, um, smishing attacks are still rising. Uh, we thought that at a, at a point uh, we hit a plateau. We're not going to see any increase in these threats, but um, uh, unlike our um, being very optimistic, uh, things are still increasing. We see we still see those as our biggest risks. Uh, increase in attacks from nation state actors. DC government is very unique. Um, everybody outside of uh, of this region or uh, outside the United States basically thinks that DC government is actually the federal government because uh, DC is the capital uh, capital city. So every time there is an attack, um, it's also targeted towards DC. That also gives us a nicer. Uh, uh, it it actually adds to our workloads of what we have to protect against. Uh, unlike some other states and uh, cities, we do have to deal with nation state actors on a constant basis. Um, I have some graphs here from uh, uh, these are worldwide trends that uh, that are there. Uh, there's a, a company Black Frog, uh, uh, Black Fog. They are a cybersecurity company. They did a, a state of ransomware uh, in 2021, and uh, as you can see, government is still the highest hit. Uh, it's not just in US, everywhere in the whole world. Pretty much, uh, government seems to be the easiest target for disruption of services, uh, followed by education. Both of those are very important for DC government and uh, for me personally. Uh, consuming day, uh, that is what we have to deal with on a on a. Uh, that's what I'm here to uh, uh, to protect and defend. On the right side, we, we have the, the statistics month over month statistics. Um, as you can see, there's a, a nice increase in October uh, 2020. That could be pandemic related or just a cybersecurity month special. So we, we have to take it as a cybersecurity month special. Even the bad actors like cybersecurity months, so they do target us a little bit more in October. There are some, uh, I, put, I put a couple of, uh, um, Again, impacting incidents. Some of the most impacting impacting incidents in recent times include the Colonial Pipeline, the Solar Winds attack, um, uh, Kaseya, JBS Foods. Um, I'm only highlighting these ones because they have a they had a very big impact on our organizations as as well as individuals as well as overall economies and and things uh, of that nature. Such an attack to a government entity will have a very significant impact to our residents and businesses. That is what we are trying to avoid. That's why we are uh, talking about this and we always ask uh, our partner and vendor community to help um, so we can um, stay ahead of the game and not, um, I can't predict the future, so I'm not gonna attempt it as well. Um, we just do our best, each of us in our roles to make sure we don't uh, end up in that, uh, that kind of a state. Nina, it's uh, Before handing off to the uh, this um, thing, any comments or any um, anything, please feel to put in the chat, and uh, uh, we'll answer uh, or take uh, any takeaways that we have to take. So. With that, uh, back to you, Nina. All right. Okay. So we're going to hand it over to Ben Gilbert. Um, Sunil, do you want to read his bio while I pull up his presentation? Or Ben, do you want to present? Uh, I could, I could, let me see if I can share my screens here. Um, okay, and... Let me make you a presenter. Okay. And my video is going. That's good. Good. Share. Okay. Does everybody see my screen? Yep. Okay. Fantastic. So that's good. Uh, sorry, I'm just moving things around. So, all right. Uh, did you want me to start or go right for it? 
Um, all right, well, I nope, I will actually give you an introduction. So um, like Sunil said, as a, today we're joined by three guests um, and they're gonna bring perspectives across federal government, DC government and the industry. Uh, presenting first, obviously, is Ben Gilbert. Uh, he is the cyber security advisor for Region 3, which is our region, which is um, with uh, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA. Um, in this role, Ben supports CISA's mission of strengthening the cybersecurity, reliability, and resilience of the nation's critical infrastructure. Um, we've already had a little bit of a preview of what he's going to talk about, so I'm really excited. And Ben, go ahead and take it away. Thanks a bunch, Nina, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Again, uh, my name is Ben Gilbert. I'm a cybersecurity advisor with the Department of Homeland Security, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or as we like to call it, CISA. Uh, some people even call it CISA, <laughs> depending on how you pronounce it. So I, I'm, I'm sure most folks on here are at least somewhat aware of us and have heard us before. Uh, but to those you know who may not have, uh, we CISA is the essentially the newest agency uh, in the federal government uh, right now. Uh, the former president signed off on the CISA uh, 2018 Act, which formed us as that newest agency under the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, our, our mission uh, at CISA, uh, simply but broadly, is to lead the national effort to understand, uh, manage, and reduce risks to our critical infrastructure. Uh, and we're doing so working to defend our critical infrastructure against various uh, threats uh, that we face today while working with all levels of government, private sector and academia to help to safeguard and secure our critical infrastructure against the threats of tomorrow. Uh, hence our motto there at the lower left hand side, defend today, secure tomorrow. Uh, and because we are so intently focused on risk mitigation at our agency, we often coin ourselves as the nation's risk advisor. So, um, Sadil kind of, you know, brought some of this up. I'm going to dig into it a little more here about some of the different cyber threats that we see out there today. Obviously, ransomware, uh, you know, uh, ranks is probably, you know, one of the top cyber threats that we're seeing out there today. Uh, there's a number of different variants. To those who are not familiar with what ransomware is, it's basically a, a type of malware, malicious software that's uh, deployed and installed on workstations that essentially encrypts all of the data on those workstations. And in order to gain access to the data that's on those workstations, you have to have a decryption key to decrypt the data. And that decryption key is oftentimes what is held as ransom, uh, hence ransomware. Now, you know, with the, the number of different variants that are out there, um, Ransomware is start, you know, these uh, different threat actors have started to e somewhat evolve their tactics to now also include uh, threatening to publish sensitive information in addition to locking up that data to really help encourage those organizations to to try to pay those ransoms that are out there. And I know DC has recently experienced this. Um, there's other, you know, localities, uh, government agencies and organizations that have experienced this as well as other um, you know, large companies and, and those in our supply chain. Uh, so just a little bit about maybe some of the different variants that, that, that we're seeing out there that are more specifically targeting uh, state and local governments, as well as uh, those in the medical and, and law enforcement healthcare sectors. Uh, RIA, for example, is a variant that, that has often been seen to target uh, those in the healthcare sector, as well as uh, K through 12 schools, uh, universities, and other state and local government entities that are out there. Conti is a more another recent ransomware variant that we've seen lately. It's actually we um, yeah, there, there's some uh, what we call uh, you know, tactics that they use that that are causing us to believe that it might have um, Conti might be a a newer variant of something such as Babic or Robinhood that, that's out there. Uh, Conti is another example of a ransomware variant that targets emergency management uh, as well as law enforcement and other healthcare providers out there. Uh, Black Matter, um, a uh, very new uh, threat actor out there, a particular ransomware variant that we're seeing targeting uh, a lot of food and agriculture uh, organizations that are out there. And we actually uh, just this week published a, a joint advisory alert, uh, CISA along with 
FBI and the NSA published a, a joint advisory alert on black matter uh, be, because um, it, it's obviously becoming uh, such a large issue. Uh, there are a number of other different variants that are out there, obviously, you know, Babic, um, you know, this area is familiar with that. Uh, dark side as well. Um, some of these variants are as a, res you know, pop up uh, as a result of kind of being uh, older, you know, newer, newer versions and kind of re, you know, reinventing uh, themselves as, you know, from the older variants to newer variants and so forth that are out there. Uh, but as I mentioned before, ransomware is just a type of malware. There are other types of malware that are out there. Um, what we call remote access Trojans or rats. Uh, these are oftentimes very sophisticated uh, types of malware often um, used to automate remote access uh, into many different information systems that are out there. Uh, Tricked by Emotet, probably, you know, the most uh, notable and notorious that are out there. Uh, Lockybot, Iced ID, Vazor Loader are also um, other examples of what we call uh, remote access Trojans that are out there. Uh, there are other types of malware, what we call wiperware, not Petya is, is probably a great example of, of what would be determined, uh, defined as wiperware. This is, um, you know, if you recall, maybe four or five years ago, uh, you know, back in the days of WannaCry, NotPetya uh, showed up uh, shortly after that is what first appeared to be a variant of ransomware, uh, but soon learned that this was a variant that did not have a decryption key. And so it was basically one way encryption, essentially just destroying any data that it encrypts. Un it's unrecoverable at that point. Uh, hence the name wiperware. So that's an example of that. And then obviously there are other uh, variants of malware that are out there that are designed to actually target um, very, uh, what we call industrial control systems or operational technology environments. So think in terms of water utilities or power companies uh, there, um, or, you know, maybe chemical facilities and so forth. There are types of malware that can potentially target some of those, uh, systems that are within those, uh, critical infrastructure facilities. Um, specifically, this is just an example of one Triton Hatman malware, uh, for example, was one that targeted, uh, the safety instrumented systems in an energy company. Um, this was something that came out of, um, an attack back in 20, uh, 2018 that we saw, and it's still uh, to this day we see you know, see variants of this creep up here and there. So, our critical infrastructure is absolutely becoming a target. And in fact, uh, last week uh, we, you know, CISA along with FBI and uh, NSA and even EPA announced a joint advisory alert that uh, water and wastewater utilities are actually becoming targeted. And I know there's a lot of those that are out there that are owned and operated by government, uh, uh, you know, city and local governments. Um, so absolutely uh, critical to be aware of these different threats. Obviously, there are what we call advanced persistent threat actors or APT actors that are out there. These are essentially nation state threat actors and those oftentimes loosely associated with nation state threat actors. Uh, these threat actors uh, are very methodical, very sophisticated, um, oftentimes have world-class experts uh, within their operations. Um, and their goal is oftentimes to target federal and local governments, uh, as well as those in the supply chain and leading industry organizations. Uh, SolarWinds, probably one of the clearest examples of this back late December, um, this kind of brings us to the, you know, threats to external, to what we call it, threats to our external dependencies. So uh, supply chain, threats to our supply chain, threats to our service providers, infrastructure providers, those third party vendors, because we oftentimes contract and, and form agreements with a lot of vendors that are, you know, oftentimes smaller businesses, they oftentimes have lesser mature cybersecurity capabilities. Uh, within them. And so a threat actor, there's a lot of the threat actors out there love to be able to target those in the supply chain because 
it's oftentimes uh, easier to access that and you have a lot more attack surface available to you once you're in that organization because then they can use that organization and pivot their attacks to, and leverage the business relationships they have with uh, you know those, those partners. So SolarWinds is you know again clearest you know probably you know one of the most notorious examples of this. Uh, Kaseya VSA is um, another great example of this. In fact, this is kind of a combination of a supply chain attack and ransomware attack uh, in one. And there, this is a trend that we're seeing continue uh, out there. So a bit uh, going back to kind of uh, our work at CISA, um, we are well versed across these seven different areas that underpin our abilities to be the nation's risk advisor, uh, particularly when it comes to areas such as partnership development and capacity building at CISA. Um, really everything that we do at CISA hinges on the collaboration with uh, our, our government partners as well as private sector out there. Um, and so one of the ways that CISA, CISA fosters these partnerships is through a what we call a regional presence across the country. And so kind of going back to a little bit about my role at CISA, I'm one of, um, I guess now five cybersecurity advisors in this region, in region three, and one of about, I'd say 50, 51 cybersecurity advisors across the country. So CISA, a part of how we've operate, uh, we operate at CISA is we've regionalized some of our operations. Uh, we've aligned to aligned those regions to how FEMA has structured their regional presence across the country as well. Uh, each region has a number of uh, administrative and support staff, and each region has a number of operational staff. Um, those can be those can include cybersecurity advisors, as well as what we call protective security advisors, as well as emergency communications coordinators and chemical security inspectors. And so, um, I'm again one of those cybersecurity advisors out in the field, and there's uh, a number of other cybersecurity advisors that that are out there as well. So. CISA offers a number of different no cost cybersecurity services. I'm not going to, in the interest of time, I'm not going to run through all of these. Just know there's a, you know, I can honestly spend another hour or two alone just talking about the number of resources and services that, that our agency offers. And we, um, we, they, they are you know, almost everything is truly no cost. Um, you know, we also like to frame it as being prepaid by our tax dollars that are out there. So these are actually tax dollars that actually go to good use uh, for a change um, and providing uh, state and local governments uh, with a number of different resources and services that are out there that come at absolutely no cost. This includes 10 different cybersecurity assessments, a number of training uh, and awareness programs that are up on our website as well, access to the information that's on there. We have an exercises team that conducts a number of different tabletop exercises. And in fact, I'm working with a couple uh, folks within um, you know, the Council of Governments and the Northern Virginia uh, DC metropolitan area to um, help to start forming and building a, uh, a a cyber exercise uh, coming probably uh, the beginning of next year sometime around there. So if you're interested in that, uh, certainly reach out to me and I can get you more information on um, what that looks like and, and you know, whether or not, um, you know, wh wh they would be accepting participants and so forth. Um, that said, a number of different informational products uh, and, and, you know, uh, on our website uh, as well. Uh, and as I mentioned um, early on, you know, uh, my role as a cybersecurity advisor, uh, like, like I said, we had upwards of 51 or so, 50, 51 across the country. I'm the cybersecurity advisor that, that um, you know, covers uh, all of Virginia and as of right now, DC. Um, we actually have, uh, are in the process of bringing on board uh, a cybersecurity advisor for the District of Columbia. Um, so hopefully, uh, you know, once we get their, their you know, clearance through, hopefully, you know, maybe in the next six to eight months or so, um, we'll actually have a new cybersecurity advisor dedicated to uh, the District of Columbia. Um, our work, uh, among other things we do, 
uh, from you know incident response coordination. Uh, we conduct a number of different cybersecurity assessments, uh, more strategically focused cybersecurity assessments. Uh, we conduct a number of workshops, working group collaboration, and so forth. Uh, we often kind of, oftentimes, kind of coin ourselves as like an advisory CISO, so to speak. So our role within CISA um, and within the region is to really be that boots on the ground, face-to-face -face touch point uh, to our agency and all of the different resources that that we could bring to bear, uh, and uh, ultimately steer organizations toward resources and capabilities that could help them to ultimately build up their cybersecurity capability. Um, I mentioned uh, you know, we have a number of different uh, operational products and informational resources that are available on our website uh, from you know advisory alerts and so forth. Um, they're off, you know, anything that's on our website is framed as what we call TLP or traffic light protocol white. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, it's just, it's, it's basically a way to identify types of information and the sensitivity of those information of that type of information. And so, um, and any organization can do it, can adopt the, this, um, type of cat categorization of, you know, sensitivity markings and so forth of organizations. So, um, you know, kind of similar to how. U.S. government, you know, does, you know, unclassified, you know, FOUO, secret, top secret, and so forth. Kind of somewhat in the same manner, but you can consider this all more or less at the FOUO level, um, just depending on the sensitivity of that information being shared that's up there. All the information that's on our website is at TLP White, but depending on, you know, whether or not um, um, there's different groups and so forth that, that we can partner with, um, you know, we, we can also share, um, more sensitive information at TLP green or Amber, um, at that level. So we share all the, these, uh, operational products, um, you know, across, uh, both the public sector as well as private sector and even, um, including with our international partners that are, that are out there. Um, so I bring this up just to, you know, when we're talking about information sharing opportunities and how the different governments in DC can connect, um, not just to CISA, but can connect to a lot of the other information sharing platforms and opportunities that are out there. Um, front and center, I would definitely say the MSI SEC or what we call the multi-state information sharing analysis center is a great resource, uh, for this. Uh, DHS funds their operation and they provide a number of different resources uh, and um, very specific information relating to state and local government organizations and different, you know, even, you know, they'll even include threat indicator sharing and, and different um, advisories uh, and, and, and so forth, vulnerability related information specific to state and local governments uh, through that. They also have a 24 by seven security operations center um, that you can give them a call and, and if you're dealing with a cyber incident, they can help you respond um, to that, that type of cyber incident. Um, and it is, I believe still free for a basic level of membership with them. They do offer kind of some fee-based services with some of their select products and resources that are up there. But by and large, it's it's free to sign up for. Would highly encourage organizations to sign up for it. The only caveat that with, with that to them is oftentimes the information that's shared is a bit more technical. Um, so would absolutely encourage, you know, if you have, uh, you know, IT managers or those responsible for IT shops uh, to absolutely sign up uh, because it's a great, resource for them. That said, there are other, what we call information sharing analysis centers and ISAOs that are, that are out there, ISACs and ISAOs that are out there. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about those, um, you can go to nationalisex.org. This, you know, the, there's, there's ISACs that range from water ISAC uh, to uh, uh, research and education network ISAC, uh, retail and hospitality ISACs actually headquartered in DC, I believe. Uh, ITI seconds, so forth. That's up there. So a lot of great opportunities to, um, you know, uh, connect with and, and, and partner to be able to share and, and you know, gain access to that, that information that's up there. Um, so 
lastly, I just wanted a, a couple, you know, maybe another slide or two here. I did want to kind of uh, highlight um, how at the 100,000 foot view level on how the federal government operates when it comes to dealing with significant cyber incidents. And so this is something that, that kind of got um, instantiated back about six, seven years ago with the presidential policy 40, uh, presidential, Pol presidential policy directive 41, uh, cyber incident coordination uh, and um, further outlined in the national cyber incident response plan basically outlines uh, three primary lanes um, when it comes to incident response efforts and how the federal government is generally speaking structured when it comes to this. So uh, from the threat response piece, uh, FBI uh, through the Department of Justice is the primary uh, the law enforcement element when it comes to threat response at the federal government. Um, CISA uh, through the Department of Homeland Security is the primary asset response uh, and asset co uh, response coordination uh, arm at the federal government level. And then obviously the intelligence community kind of working in the background to support both, both elements. So from the FBI standpoint, uh, they're primarily focused on, you know, responding to the threat. So opening up an investigation on that, on that incident. Uh, treating it, that in, uh, incident as a crime, looking for attribution and evidence to help support uh, their case and, uh, you know, bringing them to justice, um, hopefully. Uh, CISA being, you know, the asset response element, uh, our focus is to help that organization, kind of like a firefighter, so to speak, help that organization respond and help to coordinate the response to a cybersecurity incident. Um, and then obviously the intelligence community in the background. Um, I would say the biggest caveat to all of this is of course ransomware. Um, because even though ransomware is an incident, um, it is largely a recovery effort once it's happened. Um, and so what I mean by that is once ransomware has, has been deployed and, and proliferated across the network, there is not a lot you can actually do to respond once that's happened. It's all about, you know, you, you know, other than stopping the bleeding and making sure that, you know, nothing else becomes impacted at that point, it's really how quickly can your organization recover? And because it's mostly a, and largely a recovery effort, there's unfortunately not a lot the federal government can actually do when it comes to ransomware. That said, there are some resources that are out there. Um, you know, FBI, uh, you know, from the perspective of, you know, being the, the, the threat responder, they have access, they can, they, they, you know, they might have access to some of the decryption keys that otherwise might not be publicly available that are out there. Uh, they also have a lot of information related to, you know, the different threat actors that are out there. So you know what to, you're dealing with when you, you know, if you, if you contact the FBI and let them know that you're dealing with some sort of ransomware incident or so forth, they can certainly help because with understanding who the threat actor is and what you're actually dealing with and what the likelihood of recovering that data um, back is. So they are very helpful. We do have, you know, again, from a response uh, coordination perspective, uh, I, you know, as I mentioned, I'm kind of a part of my role at the agency is helping with incident response coordination. And so when folks have contacted me for uh, helping assist with uh, a ransomware incident or so forth, um, I have at times helped to coordinate, you know, coordination meetings and so forth, being able to pull in the right partners um, to help that organization respond and recover as quickly as they can and kind of, you know, help to steer them toward what, what are the next steps they ought to be thinking about taking. So there is a capability that's out there when it comes to that. Um, that said, um, I'm just going to uh, wrap things up real quick here. I can't, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that, you know, October is of course, Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Uh, CISA has, um, well, DHS um, and, and now, you know, obviously CISA 
has been uh, responsible for leading the Stop Think Connect campaign, which includes the Cybersecurity Awareness Month campaigns, and has done so actually for 18 years now, uh, believe it or not. And so uh, every year uh, we have a new theme uh, for Cybersecurity Awareness Month. This year, uh, year's theme is do your part, hashtag be cyber smart. Um, and I say that kind of tongue in cheek because this slide kind of has somewhat of a uh, error on it that I can't correct because it's a bitmap image. <laughs> so uh, it should be, uh, you know, it should say be hashtag be cyber smart, cyber smart, not cyber month up there. Um, but that is our, uh, that is uh, this year's theme. Do your part, hashtag be cyber smart. Uh, and um, within this Cybersecurity Awareness Month, we have our number of individual themes for each week. This week's theme, week three, is Cybersecurity Careers Awareness Week. So you'll see oftentimes a lot of, uh, you know, um, uh, you know uh, information on careers uh, and, and jobs that are out there, job fairs, you're, there's a ton of them going on out there. A lot of information relating to that, really trying to encourage uh, you know, folks of all sorts to, you know, become more interested in cybersecurity. Um, you know, even if you're non, not a technical person, strongly encourage, you know, taking a look at it because the reality is it is a multidisciplinary career field. Um, the, the best cybersecurity uh, practitioners are out there are multidisciplinary folks, have expertise and not just from a technical background, but maybe a psychological background, maybe a human resources background. Um, it's really looking at it from all sorts of aspects. So we really want to focus on that, um, that aspect this week. That said, I've uh, probably gone over on my time, I'm guessing. So I will stop there and see if there's any questions. Uh, and in the meantime, would strongly encourage everyone to come out, visit our website at sysa.gov. Thanks, Ben. Yep, we are avid fans of the Cyber Awareness Month um, communications plans. We actually even launched our own uh, new uh, communications plan around uh, October 1st, where we introduced two new uh, cartoon characters named Octav Octavia and Otto, helping Octavia and Otto. <laughs> educate people around uh, cybersecurity. So great stuff. Well, thank you, Ben. Sunil, did you want to add anything? Oh, thanks, Ben. Um, it's really informative and really helpful uh, for the community. Um, we do partner with uh, CISA very much. Uh, we are one of the founding members uh, in, uh, in MSI SAC as well. And they do help uh, a lot when we are going through uh, the cyber uh, exercises. Uh, one important thing, it's not just for the governments, so that's why I wanted Ben to present. Um, it is available for private entities, and uh, um, I know some of uh, some of the, uh, uh, we have some small businesses, some large businesses. It doesn't matter. Uh, this information that uh, you get from CISA and uh, MSA, uh, CISA predominantly, is actually very helpful, and uh, um, it's, it all, you having that information actually helps me very much. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, all right, so next we have uh, Debbie Blythe. Um, she is the executive public sector strategist at CrowdStrike. She'll be bringing our uh, industry perspective. Um, she provides strategic advisory services related to enterprise cybersecurity solutions for the public sector organizations across federal, state, and local higher education and healthcare. Prior to joining CrowdStrike, uh, Deborah Blythe was uh, spent seven years as Colorado's chief information security officer. So she has the government perspective as well. So she is among her peers. So Debbie, I am gonna turn it over to you. Thank you and thank you ha for having me this afternoon. Um, so in my role, I actually talk to a lot of state and local government personnel, and I'm hearing a lot of the very same themes. Um, budgets are not increasing, and if they are, it is still not enough. Staffing is a challenge in public sector because as soon as we get someone trained up, they tend to leave us for more money, which leaves us in a constant staffing shortage. 
visibility is a problem. We don't have the visibility that we'd like across all of our environments. And even without the right visibility, we still get tons of data and it's hard to determine what requires action versus what can be safely ignored. Lastly, the cyber threats are increasing in complexity, in frequency, intensity, and it's not just ransomware. The solar winds attacks brought to light significant authentication vulnerabilities and supply chain risk that perhaps wasn't high on the list of priorities before. Now, if you are an industry partner, you hear a lot of state and local personnel bemoan their lack of budget. And you know that it takes time to get the funding to purchase what is needed. Often the largest budgetary increase comes too late for cyber. Uh, for instance, when I was the CISO for the state of Colorado, my biggest budget increase came in 2019. And why was that? It was because in 2018, the state of Colorado's Colorado Department of Transportation or CDOT fell victim to a large ransomware attack. It affected almost 2000 systems and it took CDOT down for a month while we worked to recover. And later in our after action review, we were able to point to all of those security controls that had we had them fully implemented would have prevented the attack from being successful. In fact, we actually had all the right tools on site and the right projects underway that would have protected us. We just needed to be faster about implementing them. So as part of our budget request for 2019, we included services and dedicated personnel to help implement security projects. So here's a nugget for our industry partners. Don't just sell or acquire a product without thinking about and planning for the implementation. Because state and local governments have too few personnel and security projects are competing with all other IT projects, which are being done for agencies and departments. So even what should be a very quick project often takes longer than planned. Services and dedicated personnel will likely be needed to implement new technologies. Now, even when state and local governments have the budget, it is really hard to hire and retain cybersecurity professionals. When I was at the state of Colorado, we built up a little security operations center or SOC. It was comprised of three people. So obviously we were not a 24 by seven SOC. One day our very best SOC analyst left for a higher salary in the private sector. And then he recruited away our other two SOC analysts. So now we had zero SOC analysts. And I discovered this was a constant challenge. I would get people hired and trained, and then they'd leave sometimes all at once. And I really had a hard time keeping people in my most critical security area, which was those people that were responsible for and for responding to cybersecurity threats and incidents. And in a private, in a prior private sector role, I had actually built out a 24 by seven SOC. I actually got approval to hire 10 SOC analysts and a manager to build this function. However, we were a multinational company. So I was able to build this SOC in a different country at less than about a third of the cost when compared to building it locally. So for a state or local government, hiring 11 FTEs to build out a 24 by seven SOC is not realistic at all. At the state of Colorado, every time I would try to make a case to hire a full-time employee, I would get the following two questions back. Firstly, can this be automated instead? And secondly, is there a service provider who can help provide this function? Almost no governmental administration wants to grow the size of their government. And I learned that I had much better success when I was asking for tools or managed security providers. The use of tools and providers seemed to be a much more efficient way to build capacity. So in order for me to ensure that I had 24 by seven by 365 coverage, I relied upon a strategic partnership to fill those gaps for me. And whether I was fully staffed or not, or whether it was a, simply a night, a weekend, or a holiday, I knew that my partner was watching out for me and responding to security alerts and events and keeping me protected. 
knowing that my partner had my back allowed me to get a good night's rest each night. Now, obviously, efficiency is a keyword with state and local governments. They need partners who are continuously investing to improve their products to stop today's breaches. They need partners who are recognizing where the threat landscape is headed and evolving their products as the adversary is evolving their techniques. And they need partners who are providing solutions that offset their challenges, such as the difficulty hiring skilled cybersecurity personnel in the most innovative and efficient manners possible. And they need partners, not salespeople. They need advocates who are personally invested in their success. They need to hear from their partners how their peers across the nation have solved these complex problems. Now, I had a very small handful of amazing strategic partnerships that I relied upon when I was CISO for the state of Colorado. In fact, I work for one of those partners now. And I discovered how state and local governments need industry partners because state and local governments cannot solve these cyber challenges alone and they cannot defend themselves alone. And we in industry here, we are here because we are passionate about supporting and protecting state and local governments. So we need to be, we need to seek to be the very best possible partner that we can. So thank you for having me. I appreciated the opportunity to talk a little bit about my challenges and how I used industry partners to solve them in my time with the state of Colorado. Thank you, Debbie. I think that those are all great points. You know, we last month we had um, our Unleash the Possible was about uh, our digital services and what our CTI, CTO likes to say where the public expects us to be like Amazon or the Amazonification of gov government. I actually got it right. I can't believe I just said that right. And um, and I think all, all your points about, you know, the resources and the time and the ability of your gov your local government is going to vary. And we are, you know, we have the same mission and goals in mind. So, you know, this is the time and it's really exciting to be thinking about it. All right. Well, um, we will have Debbie around for a little bit longer um, after Marina will open it up for discussion. So everybody, you know, lock in your thoughts. Um, Marina, you are going to be up next and I'm just going to bring back up the presentation real fast. Thank you. All right, while you're bringing that. Oh, go ahead. No, it's okay. So, um. So, last but not least, we have our DC agency perspective um, from 1 of our most critical departments, Marina Haven, who is the chief information officer for the DC child and family services administration. She has been serving as CIO for DC CFSA for the past 3 years. Before that, she consulted with federal agencies, including the Treasury, National Park Service, and the U.S. Trade and Development Agency. Um, in addition to CFSA, Marina, we must point out, also worked at Octo. Mm -hmm. um, and she has over 20 years of IT experience. So with that, take it away, Marina. Hey, thank you. Um, I was going to say I'm really glad uh, that uh, Ben brought up the uh, available uh, resources to uh, to agencies. So I'm going to be hitting you up maybe through Sunil or uh, just directly for uh, the assessment, cybersecurity assessment. But anyways, um, so let me just go ahead and give you a little bit of background about CFSA. Um, we are the state child welfare agency responsible for uh, protecting children, uh, child victims and uh, and uh, ensuring that uh, families are safe and uh, are healthy. And that uh, requires uh, a full set of technology that we use uh, anywhere from our hotline that is run 24 by seven um, to a very robust reporting infrastructure uh, because we're constantly looking at trends and looking at um, where interventions um, support uh, positive outcomes. Um, during the pandemic, we provided uh, devices uh, similar to every other state agency in the country 
for our birth parents and um, children to participate in education and court hearings and um, what have you. Um, CFSA uh, has been uh, really refocusing our, uh, ourselves to prevention. Um, you see two pictures here uh, for uh, many, many years we've been focused on exiting to permanency. We want children out of the child welfare system. Um, and we, for the past few years, we've been focusing on keeping children away from um, the child welfare system. And I'll circle back to why that's significant. Um, in the, along that, uh, we have uh, in the past two, I think two and a half years now, have opened up um, 11 family success centers where um, they are placed in strategic areas um, in the city where we've had the most uh, referrals as well as we have uh, the highest uh, variables that contribute to uh, abuse and neglect uh, for children. Um, next slide, please. So um, getting to the, uh, to the core. Um, so in, uh, we are, you know, as I mentioned, you know, we have a hotline that is on Gov Cloud um, and uh, we have a mandated um, child welfare information system where um, in the, actually about probably two to three years ago, uh, the feds provided some additional uh, matching funds um, because all the states have had um, their systems for over 20 years. So they recognize that it's time for all the states to update their uh, child welfare information system. So um, BC is uh, taking advantage of that. We've, uh, we're currently implementing a uh, Microsoft dynamic CRM platform for our, uh, to replace our legacy. Uh, we have a little logo here, as you can see behind me, uh, and it stands for Stronger Together Against um, Abuse and Neglect in DC. Um, again, focusing on uh, our front uh, yard. Um, so what we're doing now is in addition to kind of making sure that uh, we're updating our systems in the back end, uh, also uh, allowing and, and funding uh, systems in our family success centers and in our prevention world um, to manage and keep uh, families away from the child welfare system. So what that does for us, uh, and next slide please, is uh, kind of um, puts us in an interesting place. Um, uh, currently, you know, Octo is supporting our perimeter uh, security for CFSA in terms of we've, to date, in our legacy world, we have uh, had our systems all in a, uh, data center managed and maintained by Octo. Uh, we have now, over the past three years, really shifted or currently in the process of shifting everything uh, to various cloud providers and at different levels. Um, as I said, you know, we have Dynamics, we have just Azure environment so that we run our applications for and uh, so as, as we go through that journey, uh, I feel like we do need to make some changes to our policies and to our posture, uh, but we haven't quite gotten there. And we, we, that will be a very helpful to have assessment to support us uh, so that we have clarity, not just in terms of, well, here's the security posture you're supposed to have. You have to um, you know, apply it this product and, and configure the firewall this way, but in a broader sense, what else do we need to worry about? To date, our worry has been, you know, our internal users, unauthorized use of uh, access 
full of data. Um, you know, I'm checking on my newest neighbor and I know I have access to the system. So I'm going to check and see if my newest neighbor is, you know, part of a system or not. I mean, so those are the things we prevent. In our current system, we have over 90 security roles, which to me is insane, you know, which, uh, so that people, there's really minutia of, you know, you can see A, but you can't see A1. And, and you know, is that still relevant or not? Um, so we were kind of grappling with those topics. Um, and then um, as we do move towards pushing um, funding to uh, community-based organizations and uh, to prevent families to coming into the welfare system, does that mean that we have a responsibility for them to secure that information? So just uh, when you think about it, when a family comes into the child welfare system, we put all the security controls we have, we have security policies, what have you. But when we ask a community-based organization to provide services for a family so that they don't get into the government systems. And that happens for all of us. I mean, we, have, uh, we try to move people, uh, create affordable housing so people don't require, uh, to, so they don't experience homelessness. What is the government responsibility for making sure that the community is safe and data that is being maintained on people uh, by small community organizations are being protected safely. Um, so that's just kind of what um, I've been thinking about as we're building our new system and implementing a new technology to, you know, uh, that, you know, of course, you know, we'll follow all the rules, we'll, uh, you know, we'll have, we'll meet all the new standards and do all the, you know, testing that we need to do and, and Sunil is going to keep us safe uh, and all that. So um, just some uh, food for thought for folks out there. Um, thanks. No, that's great. Thank you, Marina. Um, you, what you do is critical uh, for the families of DC and children. Um, and nobody has really uh, mentioned anything in the chat, but I do want to open it up real fast for any questions for our guest speakers, Ben, Debbie, or Marina. We really want to thank them for uh, being here today. You can either raise your hand or come off mute and uh, ask your questions. Everybody's always so quiet. Oh, this is V. How are you? Thank you so much, guys. Um, uh, my question is related to endpoint security and with all the services that DC government greatly the uh, former beneficiary of a CFSA as a ward of the city myself 20, 30 years, whatever years ago now. Now that everyone has mobile devices, are you guys providing endpoint security? Uh, because a lot of folks are accessing their systems through uh, mobile devices mostly. Just curious. We do provide security across for uh, devices provided by DC uh, and to DC government users. Um, so it's always a, a forefront. Uh, we we do tend to um, to make sure that the devices that are provided are managed, have a protection on it, and then also uh, go by a a baseline of controls. Um, since we have a, a wide variety of use cases, it depends on what controls would look like based on uh, who gets the device. Uh, but ultimately, uh, every device that DC provides has controls built, uh, built on top of them. Uh, if you're giving devices to um, the, the school kids, uh, the, the one and one to one uh, uh, initiatives, um, empowered learning initiatives, uh, all of those devices uh, do have uh, a, a nice control on them. Um, sometimes it might feel like they're actually over controls. Uh, there are regulations and compliance requirements that are mandatory and uh, to make sure that um, the children and uh, the learning um, 
who are using that for learning are protected? That answers your question. So this is Don. I was just curious about, uh, is there anything to do to be a little bit more proactive when it comes to these cyber attacks? I know it's like driving down the road, looking in a rear view mirror, trying to uh, navigate this uh, field. I just wondered if there's something that we could do as an agency, as a city, to be a little bit more proactive um, in, you know, tracking and uh, kind of uh, thwarting the thieves, if if you will say. Uh, ben, Debbie, you wanted to take that? Well, yeah, I. Yeah, this is Ben. I I, uh, I I actually had a couple slides that I, I left out that probably would have taken me another good five or ten minutes to go through on a lot of really basic security measures and protective measures that, you know, frankly, every company should be and ought to be doing no matter how small or large you are. Think, you know, simple things like have a cyber incident response plan in place, um, making sure you're not using default passwords on on you know your your it equipment right uh that's a in fact that's uh sisa actually started a a list of what we're deeming bad practices so you hear a lot of best practices out there there's actually we're trying to start a list of bad practices so you know not using default you know passwords you know default passwords that's a bad practice right um using end of life products and services out there i know there there's especially in the industrial control systems environments there are you know believe it or not still systems out there that use things like windows 7 even windows xp which have been end of, end of life for about 10 12 years now um that are just you know littered with vulnerabilities that could be easily exploited um so it's just it's just a bad practice to not ha you know have end of life another bad practice is you know and Realizing this may be a little uh, heavier lift to organizations, but not using multi-factor authentication for specifically your high value assets, um, particularly identity management systems, because those are prime targets for threat actors, right? So um, having some, you know, you know, not just username and password, having some additional means to authenticate, uh, it, you know, uh, power users and high priority users to those systems. I mean, that's just a basic level thing, right? There's on, you know, frankly, there's probably, I guess, you know, at least, you know, the list that I kind of keep rotating and tracking, probably another 10 to 15 um, things that are up there that every organization should be doing. But, you know, I'd say off the top, those are probably, you know, big ones out there. So there are things to do. Yeah, and I'll add a couple of things. So the White House came up out with a memo back in June um, that was things you should be doing to protect yourself from ransomware. But it, as Ben mentioned, it's a great um, reminder of sort of best practice, good hygiene type things. So in addition to what Ben mentioned, um, it talks about rapid updates and patching. It talks about uh, running endpoint detection and response and having encryption for your sensitive data. Um, having a skilled, empowered security team and utilizing threat intelligence, uh, wrapping that into your tools. Also having a backup strategy because um, one of the things Ben talked about is once you get hit with ransomware, there's not a lot you can do. Um, so if you have a good backup strategy, at least you can restore your data. Um, also, Ben mentioned testing your incident response plan, having an incident response plan, performing penetration testing, and having good network segmentation in place. Um, and then the other thing I would add is making sure that you've got additional sorry, additional controls and then monitoring for your privileged accounts because the vast majority of attacks are looking to get those privileged accounts. So know where they exist and make sure that you're monitoring the use of those. Thanks, Debbie. Thanks, Ben. Uh, John, uh, we, from a uh, enterprise perspective, we do have our policies that kind of almost are are um, derived based on industry best practices. 
and they all touch upon everything that Ben just indicated and Debbie just mentioned. They actually call out in there. Yes, yeah, Sunil, I definitely agree. Uh, since we had the industry experts on the line, I thought I'd pick their brain for just a second, yep. but uh, I, f I figured we're doing about all we can at this point. Um, I know that Aussie's reached out to Assista to do some external website scanning and some intrusion uh, detection things. So really looking forward to some of the results of that, but uh, appreciate the answers and appreciate the uh, input from everybody. Thank you. And we also have our partners. I just wanted to touch on one thing on there. Um, our partners are going to be very helpful. We won't be able to do this ourselves. That's the one reason I want uh, everybody to talk about, uh, uh, about this and uh, be able to participate and understand the services available. Um, we will not be able to just uh, do this battle ourselves. We definitely need our partners to help. Uh, with I that, think it's a great um, segue into the rest of the presentation. Um, Stephen Miller, uh, Sunil, we do have Stephen on the line. I don't know if he wants to um, give a little bit of an introduction based off of what he heard in his uh, event last uh, last month. I'd be happy to. So, I mean, it's really, I'd say, you know, my priorities with security align with the organization's priorities for security, obviously. Um, but just so everyone knows, uh, anyone that didn't make it last week, I'm Stephen, uh, last month, I'm Stephen Miller. I'm the deputy CTO for digital services in Octo. Digital services is our new initiative where you know, we're, we're pushing to transform uh, the government and work towards uh, what Nina said, that Amazonization, Amazonification, depending on how you want to say it. Um, uh, Government services, um, and we can't really do it without security. There was a lot uh, you guys have talked about today, um, and you know the importance of uh, security is always going to be top of mind as we look to put new services in place. Um, we're gonna, you know, we need to make sure that we're working through um, our process, and our process is spelled out here. It's ready, set, go. Um, this is our way of really describing how we're going to plan projects, how we're going to implement projects, and how we're going to further enable those projects uh, through successes after they've been deployed and, and put in place. And you can't really do any of this if, if security is an afterthought. So security is really going to be the big thing we're going to talk about up front um, every time when we're doing planning, when we're doing implementation. And security is going to be the one thing that we focus on once something's in place. We need to make sure we're going through our regular patch cycle. We're doing regular vulnerability uh, remediation, um, and you know, continuing to work with our security engineering team and our security operations team uh, to make sure that we're keeping things where they need to be. Um, and that's yeah, that's that's why we're here i guess so as i'm here my job is to improve government services make things work better and i'm going to be working hand in hand with sunil who's going to be helping ensure that those services are secure they're resilient um, and that they're uh, you know ready for the unknowns that we don't know about so thank you and sunil over to you thank you uh, again, I just want to briefly touch upon our priorities um, for the uh, from an Octo security perspective and from the DC government perspective. Um, our priorities are to securing data applications and systems. We continue implementation of our risk management framework. Um, it's not a turnkey solution. It's not going to be like a flip switch where uh, they get, it's magically going to be uh, all done. So we have a strategy in place. Uh, we are we are going to continue working towards the implementation of that uh, risk management framework. Uh, we want to prioritize projects that address the mediation of end of life system end of life systems and our applications. Again, this touches some or uh, uh, most of uh, our partners and um, uh, and vendors. Uh, if you have a system, it's it. We want you to bring it up to the agencies or um, uh, or uh, to the, the programs that you're working with. Make sure that they understand that these systems are end of life. We can use help. We don't always know everything, and we can certainly use uh, some guidance from uh, from the vendor community as well as the uh, the 
partner community to ensure um, our end of life systems are uh, properly uh, uh, addressed and remediated. Prioritize implementation of multi factor authentication where applicable. Um, as Ben indicated, multi factor authentication should be one of the thoughts uh, when we are talking about critical applications, sensitive applications, anything that hosts uh, uh, sensitive data. Uh, across any environments, uh, it should not be limited to well, this is not open to the internet, or this is only for my use. If it ho a system hosts a sensitive, if a system is hosting sensitive information, multi-factor should be given a consideration. Uh, multi-factor authentication should be given a consideration. Perform continuous assessments of systems and applications to detect and remediate vulnerabilities. This is an activity that is an ongoing. We continuously check our systems continuously. There's a scan that runs every single day. We actually know most of our vulnerabilities and we work with agencies in the mediation of those agencies, uh, uh, sorry, mediation of those vulnerabilities, not agencies, my apologies. We do continuously work on that, but in some cases, again, it we do need uh, assistance from our uh, vendor and partner community because not all vulnerabilities are just patch and uh, remediate. There might be some development activities or uh, there's some uh, replatforming that probably has to be done. That's where we will be looking towards your guidance and uh, your uh, your expertise as well. The toolkits we use, we are going to be using the same toolkit. Uh, as uh, the digital services, and you'd probably hear that uh, over and over across all of our other uh, programs as well. We wanted to use the Ready, Set, Go. Um, I won't go into each and very uh, each and every one of those uh, items, but engage, please engage in the ready stage. We want you to engage us as early into your projects or into your um, uh, proposals as possible. We don't want to take away your projects. We don't want to uh, run your projects. We wanted to partner with you. So we cover um, the cyber aspects of it, our security aspects, our resiliency, as a matter of fact, um, um, as Ben indicated. And uh, Debbie also indicated that this could be a uh, backup and recovery could be one of them that has to be thought through. Um, during the set process, architecture and design phase, we would be a very key asset. Octo, it's not just security. Octo would be a very key asset in your architecture and, and design phase. Um, a lot of systems interact uh, very tightly within DC government, and most people don't realize that until it's very late. It's it's very easy to build a system, but when you're dealing with a system that has a lot of uh, uh, interaction with other agency systems. It cannot be an afterthought, so we can definitely help you guide in that perspective and thus give you the visibility that we have across agencies. Uh, and as part of the go, communication and training and um, uh, assessments, we can help with all of those ones. We just want to be partnered in those ones too. We don't want to communicate for you, but we wanted to make sure that the right communication is happening. Um, as much as if we had to send in a bunch of emails to um, to constituents or to internal users, we can make sure that they're actually flowing the right way. All of these things sometimes doesn't feel very trivial, but they are very, uh, uh, they, they make a big difference. How, uh, sorry, go back and uh, go into the next one. Thank you. How can, uh, how you can help us? I've been um, saying this from the beginning of this uh, conversation that we were having. We want to use your expertise and provide, uh, please provide us a recommendation. We cannot be an expert on everything um, as much as uh, if anybody's saying that uh, it's never going to be true. There's no way the security team uh, or as a matter of fact, even the Octo team or even DC government cannot be an expert on every single technology out there. That's why we rely on your, uh, on you as our partners and our vendor community to help us. Ensure proper documentation is tailored for projects and solutions. Um, again, 
we want to make sure that the right documentation is handed to the uh, to the agencies so they understand when to patch how to patch what uh, what would be the uh, checks that needs to that can happen after a patching or a replatforming it helps um, that doesn't replace you the documentation doesn't replace our vendors and partners it just augments um, we having better understanding of these things we can plan better uh, to engage you earlier on uh, uh, into into these as well. Again, can't reiterate enough. Uh, engage Octo as early as possible uh, on your projects. Again, we have enough uh, work on our side. We do not have capabilities to take over projects and run it, but we can be a very good partner uh, in in your journey for uh, for your success in your projects. Uh, we do have few resources that are published today. We have policies, standards uh, that can be found on uh, octo.dc.gov. We have IT security policies uh, published. Uh, the links are in the chat window. Um, we do have some standards. We're working on more standards. Um, currently, we have standards for open data and GIS. Uh, this is very important uh, because we do have one of the uh, one of the I would say one of the best. Uh, um, uh, data teams and GIS teams here uh, in DC, and we have a, a lot more accurate uh, address repository than um, anybody else because it's our job to maintain that. And it's very accurate. If you're doing a project for DC, that is what we would like to use. You don't need to use Google, you don't need to use Bing. You can actually use our address repository in your projects, and that would make it a lot more accurate uh, in your deliveries for projects. With that, uh, we wanted to open it up for uh, for discussion. We really would like to know: Are we on the right track? What have you seen in other jurisdictions um, uh, or uh, private entities that we should consider uh, that we should be considering? What are the biggest challenges in your experience to execute a cyber resiliency plan? Who should be in the room and when? I wanted to hear from you all. We have about five minutes. I wanted to open up for a, a discussion uh, and uh, take your input. Hey, Sunil, this is Ben. I um, On one of your slides, uh, you had you were talking on the policies, which um, kind of jarred, uh, you know, a thought in my mind that was something that I had meant to mention uh, early on, but but forgotten, it's just relating to uh, incident reporting. Um, and, you know, I don't know from the, uh, you know, the district's perspective on that, um, but I want just, you know, something to mention there, because of the number and impact of the number of incidents that have been occurring lately, particularly the ransomware, there are, you know, it's just worth noting, there are um, a couple of bills on the, on the, the, uh, floor of Congress right now um, being considered. Um, both are relating to uh, cyber incident reporting, depending on, you know, whether or not you're, you know, part of critical infrastructure sector or, or not, that's up there. And they're, they're fairly similar, but there's, you know, the potential for reporting requirement as well as a, a potential for reporting whether or not uh, organizations have paid for ransomware. So. Um, you know, it's, it's just worth noting that that, you know, is likely coming down in some manner or form uh, that's up there. Um, I think a lot of the bills are pointing towards CISA being the recipient of a lot of those reporting efforts, um, you know, for better or for worse. You know, I could definitely tell you I've heard uh, from our director um, in, in the past, our, our new director, Director Easterly, in the past that, you know, she maintains that, you know, you know, we are still largely a voluntary agency, you know, and we kind of, you know, like to think of ourselves as a neutral party to all of this, right? So, um, you know, while we strongly encourage any organization to report cyber incident reporting, um, we're not one way or another for it. Um, but, you know, I will say that those are some bills that are on the floor now um you know so just you know 
be aware of, of those that that is something that we may need to build into the policies uh, within the organizations as a part of that. That's good information, Ben. Thanks for that. It'll be in the lookout. Um, any other uh, feedback? Any other, um, again, are we on the right track? Uh, Jay, take your So, Neil, I always have feedback. I don't want to occupy space if someone else is asking a question, however. No, G, please uh, ask, ask away. <laughs> Uh, interestingly, I want to congratulate Marina for being part of the 20 year anniversary of the BCGIS platform. Uh, and it continues to be an excellent resource. And I know you mentioned BCGIS as a great data source. And for those who are wondering how you can use that for security, just think about how you can use uh, geofencing and pet perimeter management integrated into your security platforms to prevent external intrusion by IP addresses that shouldn't be there for example. So it's not that DC, the GIS is part of IT security. I just wanted to say that and uh, uh, congratulations. Okay, but thank you. Uh, Jay Huey, do you want to say a few words? I don't, have, our big agencies? I don't have anything specific to Neil, but definitely would echo the comments about the partnership, state, local, and the, the work, the good work that CISA does, uh, particularly around the dot re gov registry, but also, you know, so many things, network security, vulnerability, and testing for that. So I'm curious, you know, um, how we kind of continue that partnership. And I know this has got a number of good tools. Um, do you see us sort of leveraging them individually or centrally or um, that coordination? And I think that question also doubles down with the vendor community, like, how do we plug in the, in the right ways across the spectrum of what we can all bring to this problem? Um, most of the services for CISA, we actually try to coordinate it centrally uh, because of uh, other controls that we have to put in place for the successful testing. Um, and then uh, we always, um, it, it helps with us knowing that uh, there's gonna be a test performed so we don't have to uh, block things and, uh, and um, uh, you know, prevent some communications from actually happening that that helps. So, um, I'm happy to again, I'll bring this up in our, our uh, meetings uh, to talk about it. Um, and uh, we will present a, a plan of how agencies can leverage that. But with that, we are actually at the end of the time. Um, thank you everyone for joining. Really appreciate you all um, listening in and uh, providing your feedbacks. Next event that we have is uh, Unleash a Possible Event for IT Operations. Uh, that's on Thursday, November 18th. Um, so we are hoping to see you all back um, in that event. Thank, yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you all. Everyone.